Well, here it is, Christmas week. Happy holidays to one and all. This is a holiday edition of Jonesing for Football. Bill Jones along with young Cody Winstead, and this is the week we've all been waiting for. Yes, indeed. The week that Rudolph and his reindeer set sail. And what else happens this week, young Cody? Well, Bill Jones, we've only been counting down to Eagles and Cowboys for four or five weeks now, and here we are. It's finally arrived, and I'm ready for the showdown. And what happened last Sunday? Well, the Grinch stole Christmas. <laughs> the Grinch, otherwise known as Trevor Lawrence, stole Christmas from all of us as the Jacksonville Jaguars came from behind, 17 points behind, mind you, to beat the Dallas Cowboys in overtime. And Christmas, we're, we all have a blue Christmas here in Dallas because of that, even though the Cowboys play the first place Eagles at 325 on Saturday afternoon, Christmas Eve. Well, listen, Bill Jones, I'm still hyped for the game. Obviously, um, you're not quite as hyped as you were. But it's still going to be a great game there on Christmas Eve, right? Let me let me read our text exchange at three fifty-two Texas time on Sunday. I texted you and said, "And just like that, next week's game is now meaningless." Yeah. <laughs> you responded, "Eagles haven't clinched yet." <laughs> I responded, "They're not losing their last three games." Well, Bill Jones, did you factor in a shoulder injury to Jalen Hurts? Okay, things get interesting. Yeah, all of a sudden, you know, and let me, upon further review, I've thought about this the last few days, and you know what? Who thought the Minnesota Vikings would come from 33 points down at halftime to beat the Indianapolis Colts? Not me. Not me either. So all things are possible in this National Football League. It is possible. The Eagles, perhaps without Jalen Hurts, will lose to the Cowboys on Saturday afternoon and then lose to the New Orleans Saints and then lose to the New York Giants. And the Cowboys will beat the Eagles. And then on Thursday, a late Tennessee Christmas win over the Titans and then a win on the road at Washington. And the Cowboys will have the number one seed in the NFC. Well, even if not, the Cowboys have to win to hold off the 49ers or try to get to the Vikings in the second seed there. So they're still playing for seeding in the NFC. Oh, I'm sorry. They're the five seed. You're right. Oh, I'm yes, sorry. that's right. They are the five seed. In oh, fact, yeah. And in fact, they're pretty much. They aren't awesome. mathematically locked into the five seed, but they are virtually locked into the five seed, which made that loss to the Jacksonville Jaguars so devastating just from a fan standpoint where, you know, if they beat the Eagles, then there's a chance it could come down to the final game of the regular season, even though the, what are the chances the Eagles would lose to the Giants, whatever. But all right, to get it, it is, we always start with our favorite game of the week. And yes, it's sir. still our favorite game of the week. And yes, you never know. As, as soon as we start saying things like, well, the Eagles got it all clenched and everything. Well, Jalen Hurts goes down with an AC joint sprain, and now uh, things change. And uh, we've seen it too many times in the NFL. So you just clear the slate of all that stuff and look at the matchup on paper. And this is a great Christmas Eve matchup. Very much, uh, Bill Jones. Do you want me to explain the format of the podcast before we officially jump into it? That would be true. You know, I think there's a, probably only one loyal viewer and listener, and that would be Babe Loffenberg, who has it memorized. So perhaps you should go through the format. Okay, here we go. I'll do it quick. Every week, it is my responsibility to outline how we do this podcast. We break it into three topics, our favorite game on the schedule, a musty individual matchup. And then we save the best for last, which is pressures on at somebody who's directly in the spotlight this week. Bill Jones, we're sticking with a, a Cowboys and Eagles 
is our favorite game, both of our favorite games, I think for the first time in the history of Jonesing for football, we're going to share uh, the favorite game, but give me how you uh, see this game um, Sunday there in Dallas. Break it down for me. Well, I think that the Cowboys, and by the way, my pressure's on is really going to be good this week. I must say, if I don't say so myself, pressure's on is really going to be good this week. All right. That's at the end of the show. Okay. Got but it. don't scroll forward yet. All okay. right. I, th- I think the Cowboys are going to overcome the devastation of that loss and put their best foot forward uh, because I don't know that players have done the research that we have done on what the mathematical chances are of winning a division. They just know that the division title has not been clinched. They just know that They lost to the Eagles in Philadelphia, and that sour taste is still in their mouth. And they just know they didn't have Dak Prescott on the field for that game in Philadelphia, and they've got Dak back. And despite the picks, (laughs) he has led the Cowboys to a whole lot of points here in the last six weeks of this season, the most of any team in the NFL. And uh, so I think that they feel like that they've got some things going for them, especially especially if Jalen Hurts isn't suiting up for the Eagles on uh, Saturday. We shall see on that. Uh, So I think that uh, it's going to be a a really good matchup. Uh, The Cowboys are are dealing with some issues right now injury-wise, which uh, contributed mightily to that loss to Jacksonville. Uh, They've had two cornerbacks now go down for the season, of course, and Jordan Lewis and Anthony Brown. And so you're basically, you've got your fifth cornerback out there in Kelvin Joseph, who incredibly was a second round draft pick last year. They had to bench him during the game against Jacksonville and their third round pick who hasn't really played got into the game. Was that Joseph? Was that Joseph who was chasing that Jags wide receiver from behind? Was that him? (laughs) Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it was. Yes. Well, uh, here. Okay. How about this? The last eight games, the Cowboys are six and two. Their only two losses came on the road in overtime to Aaron Rodgers, Christian Watson out of the big green NFL draft scouting notebook and the Packers. And then against the Jacksonville Jaguars and Trevor Lawrence going off in the third and fourth quarter of that game, both overtime losses. All right. What happened in both of those games? Well, Cowboys pre in the green Bay game had just lost Jordan Lewis for the season. And Anthony Brown went down early in that game. I think he played like 23 snaps in that game. So Kelvin Joseph got, got thrown into that game and the Packers targeted Kelvin Joseph and they were able to score 31 points and win that game. Well, now here, this is the second game since Anthony Brown went down with a season ending Achilles injury. It was against Houston the previous week and the Texans almost beat the Cowboys. And then this week, clearly Jacksonville was targeting number one, Kelvin Joseph in their comeback. So there's a, there's a little theme there. The other thing, the Cowboys lost Leighton Van Der Esch five plays into the game against Jacksonville, and that's a big loss. Leighton has been playing very well. In fact, he's coming off a a 14-tackle game against Houston uh, the week before. And so they're playing a rookie, Damone Clark, at linebacker. And Anthony Barr is really out of position playing an inside linebacker. He is more of an outside, like a Sam linebacker and a a pass rusher from the outside who can drop in coverage. So – uh, that that's an issue. And especially when you're facing a Philadelphia team, if they had Jalen Hurts at quarterback and they're in the run game that the uh, Eagles possess. Uh, so that those are big issues. And so what, when I break it down, I look at the offensive line for the Eagles. And if you look back through their entire season, they have been virtually injury free. They had a little spot there right before the Cowboy game where they had uh, one of their players go down with an injury but they've only missed 250 snaps on around 250 snaps amongst their projected five starters on their offensive line this season. While the Cowboys with Tyron Smith being out for virtually the entire season, coming back last week for the first time playing right tackle, they're at like 1200 uh, missed snaps on their offensive line. Offensive line has played well. Tyler Smith at left tackle has played well for a rookie, but 
when you break it down, I think if you look at most all of the teams that are successful right now, it's whether they've had a healthy offensive line or not has been a big key. And the Eagles have had that. Yep, uh, for sure. Here's how I'm going to um, look at this game, Bill Jones. And truthfully, the injury to Jalen Hurts um, almost makes this game more intriguing to me. And I'll, I'll get to that in a sec. First and foremost, let's just get this out here. It's still a monster matchup, Bill Jones, featuring the best two teams in the NFC. It's likely a playoff preview, whether it's in the conference semifinals or whether it's on championship weekend. They're the two highest scoring teams in the NFC. And I think both defenses are elite as well. So let's not let the injury to Hurts or the Cowboys' recent struggles cause us to lose focus on the quality of both of these teams. Number two, I mentioned Gardner Minshew. With him likely starting, this is a great opportunity for Philly to get back to basics offensively. Lean on that O-line. It's helped them be a top five rushing team each of the last two seasons. And I want to see their running backs lead the way. Just 14 carries for the Eagle backs last week versus Chicago. That was three less than Jalen Hurts had by himself. And in the last three weeks, it's Sanders, Gainwell, and Scott are averaging a combined just 18 carries a game. So look for a heavy dose from those guys. And my other focal point is which of these teams is able to pressure the quarterback. In their first game back in week six, the Cowboys had four sacks. The Eagles had zero. But since then, things have kind of shifted in the other direction. Eagles now lead the league in sacks with 55. The Cowboys are number two with 49. And December is a big reason why. Philly has 19 sacks this month. Dallas has just four. So the biggest reason I'm high on both these teams, terrific in the trenches, both a mix of good youth, veterans, and depth. I think the Cowboys should win this game. Although I will say, here's my bold Gardner Minshew point, Bill Jones. So listen up here. Gardner Minshew can play. And yes, at one point in the offseason, I was quoted saying the Eagles would win 10 games if Gardner Minshew was their starting quarterback this season. So I would take the points. Eagles take, if you're the Eagles, take the points. Uh, but I do think the Cowboys win the game there on a Saturday in Dallas. Whoa! Whoa! How about the that? The man in Philadelphia picks the Cowboys to beat the Eagles. And this was this is what's going to be interesting. when they When they meet in the playoffs, the Cowboys will have won one against the Eagles backup quarterback and the Eagles will have won one against the Cowboys backup quarterback. And then hopefully in the postseason, we'll get both starters, Dak and Jalen, and we'll see who the best team really is. Wow. That's I'm, I'm just stunned that the man in Philadelphia has picked the Cowboys to win, even with Gard, Gardner Minshew at uh, quarter. Uh, well, with Gardner Minshew at quarterback for the Eagles. You know, the Cowboys, they only have one sack the last two weeks. They did not get to the Texans quarterbacks, and they only – Michael Parsons got his 13th sack of the season uh, early in that game against Jacksonville on Sunday. But you look at the Eagles' sack totals across the board, and the other that's another injury issue the Cowboys are facing. Dorrance Armstrong, who has a career-high eight sacks on the season, uh, he went down with a knee injury and was already – uh, dealing with a sprained ankle in that game against Jacksonville. But the Eagles, Hassan Reddick has 12 sacks on the season. Javon Hargrave, boy, what a handful he is in the middle. He's got 10 sacks from an interior defensive lineman position. Brandon Graham's got eight and a half sacks, nine and a half sacks for Josh Sweat. Fletcher Cox even has six sacks. And I like Milton Williams, the young guy from right here in Crowley, Texas, uh, who I did an interview with leading up to the draft uh, last year, third round draft pick uh, last year, uh, the Eagles. And um, he's got three sacks on the season. So uh, it's going to be a real test for the Cowboys offensive line. And, you know, the other thing is they didn't get to Cooper Rush because Cooper Rush was getting rid of the football quickly. I mean, one of the main reasons the Cowboys are, scoring so many more points now is uh, Dak will will wait it out and go through his progressions and sometimes that uh, pays off big and sometimes it pays off not so big right uh two things before we move on 
you mentioned the Eagles D-line. You didn't even talk about Jordan Davis. You didn't talk about Linville Joseph. You didn't talk about Indomitian Sue and, <laughs> or Robert Quinn, who's on IR. And I'm not sure Robert Quinn's all that hurt. I just think they have a ton of defensive mm-hmm. linemen that have kind of maybe jumped him in the uh, depth chart there. But that's just me. One thing I want to give you credit on, Bill Jones, because I think you and I nailed this last week on both the Cowboys game and the Eagles game. You pointed out, could Dallas – and maybe even Philly be looking ahead to this monster matchup this week. And you said, hey, keep an eye on the Jags, keep an eye on the Bears. And obviously, um, obviously the Jags won and the Bears played the Eagles much closer than expected. And I kind of said the same thing. I thought the game was going to be closer and Justin Fields would show out against the Eagles, which I I think everyone agrees. The kid's really good and, um, you know, kept it close against the team that, uh, they probably should have uh, beaten more handily, but Fields is really. But I don't. I don't think the Cowboys lost to Jacksonville because they were looking ahead to Philadelphia. I, just, I give credit to Jacksonville for uh, playing very well. They've been playing very well, as we talked about early in the season. You could see Trevor Lawrence coming along even before their five-game losing streak, and then he's just gotten on a roll here the last six games, where they've gone four and two, and I think he's got fourteen touchdowns and only one interception uh, the last six games. Um, uh, so, uh, and well, my point is, my point is we both said, Hey, these games are going to be probably closer than most people are thinking. And they, and they definitely were. And, and really they probably don't lose to Jacksonville last week. It was, uh, if, if, I mean, Dak, Dak gets charged with the interception on the pick six to end the game, but he can't throw a better ball than what he threw to Noah Brown. And it just it clanked off Noah Brown. And now I give credit to Jacksonville. I think as that play played out and we'll move on here because just real quick just like Jacksonville was targeting number one for Dallas when he was on the field Kelvin Joseph I think the Cowboys were targeting number 37 Trey Herndon for Jacksonville as you saw C.D. Lamb early in that game I mean he was just eating his lunch all day long and so as on that third and three play in overtime pre-snap I was looking at okay where's 37 who's he lined up against and he was lined up against Noah Brown in the slot and then Noah, Noah runs uh, the shallow cross across the middle. And I give credit to Mike Caldwell and that Jacksonville uh, defensive scheme because they had their safety, Rayshon Jenkins, sitting there in zone coverage on the opposite side to help out on any crossing routes like that. And so he was in perfect position when the ball went off Noah Brown and he was there for the tip drill touchdown. One thing, uh, and that's a great point. I thought the same thing. Uh, the throw was perfect. Kind, kind of kept when him forced Brown to go low because the safety was right there. You know, like if he was, if Dak would have thrown a normal pass, he would have gotten he got lit up. Safety. The low yeah. throw was actually perfect to kind of bring him down and avoid the hit. I and under pressure funny. too. Correct. I want to say this about Jalen Hurts injury because obviously this is a big thing here in Philly, and heck, he might be the MVP of the league, so it's a big um, deal overall. We have, to have, we have to have context on this shoulder injury. If you saw the play, you noticed uh, during the game, took Jalen a little bit of time to get up. I, my first thought was, there goes a collarbone, right? Like I thought some sort of clavicle or collarbone was broken. He got back up. And what was surprising was the next three plays were passes. So I, he, he was hurt, took time to get back up. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, like this could be really bad. Eagles went pass on the next play complete pass on the following play after that complete then another pass and he actually threw 10 passes after the shoulder injury so I think that's important to note I mean we know it's not supposed to be uh, a serious injury but 10 passes after the injury um, so we should be fine for Jalen Hurts um, whether it's next week or the following week or you know whenever they or when it gets important which is four weeks from now after their first round by the playoffs Exactly. Well, they get, they also got to lock up home field advantage. You know, that that's important as well. They're going to do that. Hopefully. That's my prediction. That's, mm-hmm. that's my bold per- prediction is they will lock it all up. I think so. All right, Bill Jones, one let's get to the individual matchup. I think we talked about this game enough. You can't talk about that game enough. But individual matchup. I'm looking at a coaching individual matchup. This week, And it's an important game for the Seattle Seahawks as they go to Kansas City and take on the Chiefs. But how about the coaching matchup in that game? Pete Carroll versus Andy Reid. Two of the older coaches. Yeah, two of the uh, 
older coaches in the league who have both won Super Bowls as head coaches in this league. Of course, Kansas City uh, winning it uh, under Andy Reid a few years ago and Pete Carroll early, relatively early on in his tenure with uh, Seattle. These are both West Coast guys, California guys who um, you look at Andy Reid now here with Kansas City is in his 10th season with the Chiefs after 14 years as a head coach in Philadelphia. And then prior to that was an assistant coach at Green Bay in the 90s, 92 through 98. And of course, they won the Super Bowl in the 96 season. When you look at Pete Carroll now, Pete Carroll is 13 years in Seattle. Prior to that, nine years as the USC head coach. And prior to that, in the NFL, was the head coach of the New England Patriots for three years. Defensive coordinator for the San Francisco 49ers, 95 and 96, was the uh, defensive coordinator for the Jets in, in, starting in 1990 and became their head coach in 1994. And so, I mean, just look at the experience of these two. Andy Reid, an offensive coach in his roots, of course, and Pete Carroll, a defensive coach. So I love that uh, part of the matchup. But yep. I did some research last night on – so how many times do you think Pete Carroll has matched up against Andy Reid in his career? And Seattle being in the NFC, yeah. Kansas City being in the AFC, it's not very often, of course. So I went back uh, to when Pete Carroll became the head coach of Seattle. 2011, they faced Philadelphia when Andy Reid was the coach there. Seattle won that game 31-14. Next time they matched up was 2014. Seattle lost to Kansas City, 24-20. And the last time they matched up was 2018, and it was a Seattle 38-31 win over Kansas City. And, of course, Patrick Mahomes was at quarterback for the Chiefs in uh, that football game. So as a head coach, the head coaching matchup, Carroll has the advantage, two wins, one loss, Okay. But you go, I want to take you further back, okay, back, to the, back to the 90s. And Andy Reid was a tight ends coach and assistant offensive line coach for the Packers during his time there. And um, before he got the head coaching job at Philadelphia. And in 1995-96, of course, San Francisco was great. They were coming off a Super Bowl win in 90, uh, the 94 season. Pete Carroll becomes the defensive coordinator there in 95, 96. All right. When they, uh, when they played each other, they played each other in 95 and green Bay quarterback by Brett Favre beat Pete Carroll's defense. It's 27, 17. And then in 96, they faced each other in the regular season. Green Bay won in overtime and then the divisional playoff again, Green Bay beat San Francisco on their way to winning the Super Bowl that year. So Carroll was 0-3 against Andy Reid, quote-unquote Andy Reid. Yeah, Andy Reid's tight ends. Yeah, he was a tight ends coach. But yeah. And then prior to that, they played when uh, Carroll was with the Jets. Uh, he went 0-2. Uh, so as an assistant coach, Carroll was 0-5 all time against Andy Reid. And, and well, he was a head coach there for one year with the Jets too. But so all time, it's a two and six record for Pete Carroll against Andy Reid. So my money's on Kansas City this week because of that research right there. <laughs> I love the deep dive by Bill Jones. See, you don't get that on any other podcast right there. <laughs> I wonder how much they'll talk about that when they're meeting in the in before the game and on the field and chatting. Hey, remember back in 95 I, when we yeah. twice in the same <laughs> That's exactly right. You know that will be the case. Actually, I think Andy Reid was the assistant head coach. He was at the last couple of years there in Green Bay. I mean, that's how he became the head coach for the Philadelphia yeah. Eagles. It wasn't like he was uh, a graduate Highlands assistant. coach right to a yeah. head coach. <laughs> right. I, Quality I'm, control I'm, guy. Right. All right. Uh, love that, Bill Jones. Well done there. Hey. My individual matchup pairs a couple guys with a ton on the line this weekend. It's Joe Burrow and the 10 and four Bengals visiting Bill Belichick and the seven and seven Patriots. It's 1 p.m. Saturday. I'm trying to give the times for these games because they're all over the weekend, as you know, with the holidays. Uh, Cincy 
still playing for the number one seed in the AFC while New England is essentially playing for their postseason lives. Let's talk about Joe Burr first because he's doing it again, just like last year. He's the biggest reason for the Bengals streaking into the postseason. Did you know they've won five straight in December dating back to last year? That's when Cincy turns it on. That's when Burrow turns it on. And in those games, Burrow, 13 touchdowns, just two interceptions. And what I like about Cincy's offense when I look at this, Bill Jones, a great group of skill players, which we know, but they're not reliant on any of them. They have five players with 48 or more receptions. Now I'll add a little context for you. The Cowboys have one. The Eagles have two. The Bengals have five. And it was on display Sunday against Tampa. Chase, seven grabs. Boyd, five grabs. Higgins, five grabs. Mixon, five grabs. So Burrow, terrific at spreading the ball around, making things really difficult on opposing defenses. And speaking of defenses, obviously that leads to Bill Belichick. We'll see what he has planned in what is essentially a must-win game for New England. Obviously, the incredible ending last week versus the Raiders is going to make it tough to rally the troops. I think that's got to be one of the most gut-wrenching losses in NFL history. But let's highlight the positive for the Pats. Dr. Jones, did you know, since week nine, the Patriots have the best defense in the league, allowing just 261 yards per game. We talked about Philly and Dallas being the top two teams in sacks. Well, guess who's number three? You're right. That is the New England Patriots. They're also tied for fourth in takeaways. So all the pieces are there for a really good chess match between Burrow and Belichick. This is actually their first time meeting Burrow and Belichick. But the Patriots haven't beaten a good team all season, except the Lions. They are a good team. Uh, I don't think it starts this week. Give me Cincy. And then let's start that hype machine for next week when the Bills and Bengals square off on Monday night football. Oh, I thought you were going to start the hype machine for next week when the Dolphins play the Patriots in what will be a critical game as not going to be playoff. critical, Bill Jones. Not that's going to be that's going to be a beatdown. That's going to be a beatdown, not critical. So you're thinking Miami is going to beat Green Bay this week? Oh, for sure. Where where's that game? That's in that's in South. That's Beach, in right? Miami. Yes, that's yeah, right. Exactly. That, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Show up. He's which about by to the eliminate way, eliminate Aaron Rodgers from the playoffs. Which by the way leads me to I got another individual matchup I'd like to throw in if that's okay with you. Please do. Uh, it's coaching. It's another individual coaching matchup, and it's Green Bay against Miami. How about that little coaching matchup where you've got Matt LaFleur's Packers against Mike McDaniel's Dolphins and the history of those two coaches, relatively young coaches, when uh, at least when you compare them with Pete Carroll and Andy Reid. I mean, yeah, they're both younger than me, and I'm young Cody. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know how old you are, young Cody. Are you going to reveal that? Not as young well, as Matt LaFleur is 43 down. years old. Oh, no, then, then he's older than me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And Mike McDaniel is 39 years old. Okay, we're the same age. <laughs> You're perpetually 39 years old. Yep. All right, but you go back with the, these two, and it goes back, of course, to the Shanahan coaching tree as they were both with Washington together uh, as Matt LaFleur was with Washington as the quarterbacks coach 2010 through 13. Mike Shanahan was the head coach and then Mike McDaniel got there in 2011 was there 11 and 13 and then it was LaFleur was and, and McDaniel were together again in Atlanta, 2015 and 16. And of course, they were with Kyle Shanahan there yep. and they went to uh, the Super Bowl. And then Shanahan got the San Francisco job and McDaniel followed him to San Francisco. And LaFleur went to the Rams under Sean McVay for one year and then went to Tennessee and wound up in Green Bay as the head coach. And so it's just interesting. You go back and look at the, that coaching room 
in Washington a decade ago where you've got Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan, Mike McDaniel, Matt LaFleur in that same room together. Yep, yep. And uh, it's interesting that like 35% of the league all comes from, you know, that like tree now, you know, (laughs) Zach Taylor's in the mix as well, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, Press Taylor, who's offensive coordinator or quarterbacks coach with Jacksonville now, whatever, Zach's younger brother. Anyway, just uh, very interesting there. Uh, I like it. And they're all running the same offense. You know, they're all kind of running the same offense and same scheme. Eventually the whole league is going to be running that scheme. And I don't, what's funny, Bill Jones, is I say this all the time. If you are an owner and you have a head coach opening, why in the hell would you not go for one of these guys? The 49ers have won the division. The Dolphins are going to the playoffs. I I know LaFleur and the Packers are struggling this year, but they've had the number one seed in the NFC the last couple of years. Bengals went to the Super Bowl. Like all these guys, uh, the Rams won the Super Bowl last year. Obviously, all these guys are dominating the league. Um, All right, Bill Jones, that leaves pressures on. And I want you to go first on the pressures on, okay? I I want to cap it off with my pressures on. Okay, we'll save this big capper, which you teased off the top. We'll save it for the Uh end. All right. There's got to be some extra pressure on Taylor Heineke and his seven, six, and one commanders as they visit the Niners on Saturday. Washington clinging to that seventh and final playoff spot in the NFC, just half a game up on the Lions and Seahawks. Heineke has to get things going in the right direction after a tie and a loss in their last two games, both against the Giants, oddly enough. Uh, But let's be honest, they need more from their offense, and it starts with their quarterback. Washington has scored over 30 points just once this season. That's insane. Uh, He'll have his work cut out for him this week against the Niners. San Francisco has the longest winning streak in the league, seven straight. Their defense, number one in points and yards. I just saw them in Seattle shut down Geno and the Seahawks. So good luck going against Bosa and Armstead and Warner and Greenlaw and Hufanga and every anybody else you want to throw from that loaded defense. Here's the point. Listen, we've seen Taylor Heineke in each of the last three seasons. He's always been the scrappy backup, given 110% trying to make plays. But I don't think he's ever had real expectations. He does now, Bill Jones. He's the starter. So 20 points per game which is what they're averaging since he took over, just isn't good enough. A loss this week against the Niners and the Commanders are likely outside the playoff mix. So pressure is on you, Taylor Heineke. You got a chance not only to get your team into the playoffs, but maybe secure your job for next year. Come on, Taylor Heineke, time to show up in what would be a huge win against the Niners. That would be a huge win, and there's no way that the Washington Commanders are going to win that game, right? One would think that. I mean, I don't know if anybody would would pick the um, Commanders if if they had to. Yeah, which uh, means that things are uh, things are clearing up a little bit in the wild card race in the NFC. And and I had Washington beating the Giants, and they probably they might have had a opportunity to beat the Giants had it been had it not been stolen away from them at the end of that game which which call was more egregious Bill Jones the pass <laughs> interference or the uh, illegal motion or shift where McLaren wasn't on the line mm, but, both bad. yeah uh which do you think I mean, the pass interference was incredible that that wasn't called he literally that was a pass interference at every single point in that play from the snap until the ball was incomplete, you could have caught a flag. All right. You ready for my pressures on? Give it to me. Let's go. There is no one who has more pressure on him this week than this person. Okay. When you're playing, when Christmas falls on a Sunday and you've got so many games on Christmas Eve, in fact, There's a Sunday night, I mean, a a Saturday night game. There's a Christmas Eve night game, okay? I know, I'm going to be there. I'm covering the game. Are you really? So you're going to be in Pittsburgh for the Raiders and the Steelers, 8.15 Eastern time on the NFL Network on Saturday night. 
Yes. Wow. And then there's three games on Christmas Day on Sunday. Okay. Starting with Green Bay, Miami at noon, Dallas time, then Denver and the Rams at 3.30, and then Tampa Bay and Arizona the night game. You know who has more pressure on them than anyone in the world? I, I do not. This is someone who's going to be at every – every. you tune into any of these games, and he is going to be at every single game on Christmas Eve, and he will be at every single game on Christmas Day. And in the meantime, somewhere between about 11 o'clock Eastern time on Saturday night and 1 o'clock, well, actually, by about 6 o'clock in the morning, he has got to make rounds to every single house in on the, the United planet. States and beyond. Yep. Wow. And that would be good old St. Nick. The Saint pressure it, when, the, when the NFL plays on Christmas weekend, there is no one who has more pressure on him than St. Nicholas himself. Wouldn't that's you agree? True. No, that's true. And just think about this, Bill Jones. This is what's going to be tough is. How many NFL fans at the top of their holiday wish list is going to have a win for their team number one on their list? So he's going to have to come through with those as well. You know, that's a, that is a lot of pressure. Well, he can he can handle that because he's <laughs> because if if you don't get a win for Eagles fans, okay, if if Santa Claus is making a choice. Who's going to win on Christmas Eve between the Cowboys and the Eagles? Who do you think he's going with? He's remembering the, the old days when, when Philly treated him poorly. <laughs> he gets booed in Philadelphia. He gets snowballs packed with batteries thrown yeah. at him in Philadelphia. Yeah. Cow I told you the Cowboys are winning. See, that that's the biggest that, reason. That why. seals like, it right there because it's Christmas Eve. Yeah. And here in Texas, good old hospitable Texas, we are going to welcome Santa Claus with open arms. And then Zeke, Dak, and Santa will jump into the Salvation Army Red Kettle together. That's that would be very nice. <laughs> and uh, what, and what Santa. Fun. Being the giver that he is, will pay the fine for Zeke and Dak jumping into the red kettle together. That's true. That, that's <laughs> true. That would be nice. Um, well, what good one, Bill Jones. That was a great way to uh, to end it. I love your pressure. <laughs> that's the right. Decision right there. All right. So you're going to be in Pittsburgh on Christmas Eve, and then you're going to have a late Tennessee Christmas as well, as you're going to be in. Nashville next Thursday for the Cowboys and the Titans and somewhere in between, you know, you might, the pressure might be on you more than anyone. You're, you're Thursday, you're at the Jets Jags game. And then Saturday, the Steelers game. And then next week. Wow. No one's got a busier schedule than you do, except for Santa. Except for Santa. Yeah. And I don't, yeah. So I'm going um, New York, Pittsburgh, Memphis, actually, for the family, then going to Nashville, <laughs> and then I'm not sure on the following weekend, but I'm sure I'll be covering a, an NFL game the following weekend, which would be um, uh, New Year's Eve weekend or whatever. That's right. That's right. Yeah. All right. So uh, and so next week we will uh, do this again, and we might have to sneak in a little uh, prediction on the college football playoff as well, as that will be coming up. Can I just give you my prediction? Go Bucks! It's not about <laughs> if we're winning. It's about how many we're winning by. We're going down, SEC. And who do you want to play in the national championship game? Oh, of course we want Michigan. Bring them <laughs> on again for a rematch. We would take TCU. If TCU wins and we want to face them for the title, we'll, we'll handle up on that. But I want a rematch against the Wolverines. All right. Well, maybe you'll get your Christmas wish. All right. That is the thing I want the most right there, a, a rematch against Michigan. Mm. All right. So that does it for a uh, holiday edition of Jonesing for Football, and we'll do it again next week. In the meantime, Merry Christmas and happy holidays to one and all.